move to the last paper of this session by uh, Philip Locke on the impact of China trade on the US. Okay, great. Well, thank you so much to the organizers for uh, including our paper. Uh, this is joint work with Nick Bloom, Kyle Hanley, and Andre Carmen. Uh, so what we're going to be talking about today um, is sort of re-examining the effect of the China shock um, on US employment uh, with a particular focus on um, how the China shock may have reorganized the US economy, um, specifically how employment's changed across uh, geography, industries, um, uh, and uh, sectors. So uh, I want to start with basically just two uh, quick facts and a question. So basically, um, and it was a perfect lead into the paper before this, um, you know, we basically have two facts that we, uh, we know. The, there's been a really large rise in import competition from China um, uh, over the last couple of decades. Um, and this has been sort of dubbed the China shock and has been shown to have pretty large negative effects on US manufacturing employment as well as other outcomes. At the same time, however, the US has experienced really large reorganization in uh, production and employment, uh, specifically towards some higher tech um, manufacturing activities as well as sort of non-manufacturing. And this has been shown by Arne Dorn as well as Bernard and uh, Ford et al. So the, so the basic question, you can think of this as just saying, we're, we're asking a relatively simple question, which is how, how are these two phenomena related? Um, and to what extent uh, the increase in trade from China caused this reorganization? And to the extent it does, uh, how does this potentially change our understanding of, of that shock itself? So this, to, to some extent, uh, this question is uh, well summarized by this uh, quote from the Wall Street Journal, which is uh, the phrase in the back of an iPhone is designed in Apple, uh, signed by Apple in California, assembled in China. So to what extent the rise of China as a production hub has led to sort of a growth in sort of um, non-manufacturing employment, including design. Um, so how are we gonna do this? And in what way is this gonna be different from what's been already done in the literature? Um, our basic measure of exposure to uh, the China shock uh, is going to be very similar to literature in, in an effort to sort of um, more directly compare our, our findings to the literature. Um, and what we're really going to bring to bear in sort of a, our ability to make a contribution here is using census uh, microdata. So this is going to be establishment and firm level data, which is going to be able to allow us to link um, uh, activities over time and across establishments and firms, as well as across firm characteristics, including uh, geography, sector, trade status, and so on. Um, the benefits we see here are, again, one, that we're going to see sort of an improved accuracy of the data. Again, so this is going to be establishment-level data, um, and then just sort of measure this reorganization in a slightly, um, in a way that has not been done in literature uh, as much. Okay, so before we sort of go into the nitty gritty and I, I show you uh, probably too many results, um, I wanna sort of just fix ideas and thinking about sort of the three main outcomes that we're gonna be focusing on, or three main takeaways. The first thing we're gonna, be, we're gonna show um, is that there is, as the literature has shown, a large and significant negative effect in manufacturing. Um, however, we're gonna show that at the local level, we're actually gonna find that a lot of this, if not, all of this um, is actually offset by increases in employment uh, within non-manufacturing. So we're, we're gonna find um, on average, and that's an important point, um, there are not going to be large total reductions in employment across commuting zones, or within commuting zones, rather. Right. Um, one reason for this is we're gonna highlight there's actually gonna be substantial reorganization within large importing firms towards service-related activities. Um, one important attribute of this is actually gonna be uh, within uh, establishment and within firms switching of activities. So moving away from manufacturing towards non-manufacturing. And this is gonna account for a large amount of that non-manufacturing employment loss. And at the same time is gonna account for some of that non-manufacturing employment gain. Um, this organization is also going to, while we're not going to have direct evidence of this, this is going to lead us to be thinking about the China shock as potentially 
more of a offshoring shock than an import competition shock in the sense that most of this um, employment changes are going to be within these large importing firms. Uh, ooh, sorry. Uh, and the third aspect of this paper, which actually dovetails really nicely with the previous paper, is that we're going to uh, also be highlighting the sense that this, um, while these average effects across commuting zones have important and interesting attributes, there's also going to be important dimensions of heterogeneity. So specifically, we're going to be focusing on a different dimension of heterogeneity than, than, um, than housing elasticities. We're going to basically be focusing on human capital intensity. And we're going to show that there's actually striking differences in the um, effect of the China shock across these areas. So we're going to show that in high human capital areas, which are going to be largely concentrated in, in, in um, large cities and along the coasts, um, we're going to find relatively small manufacturing job losses. And these are going to be offset by larger non-manufacturing job gains and often in sort of higher, um, higher wage non-manufacturing employment. Conversely, um, in low human capital areas, again, this is going to be sort of Midwest and the South, some of the more traditionally thought of areas that are sort of hit by the China shock. We're going to find much larger non-manufacturing, sorry, manufacturing employment losses. Um, and those are not going to coincide with the same sort of gains of uh, manufacturing employment that we uh, observe in the high human capital areas. So this reorganization, um, you know, we, we think of some of this reorganization as a potential silver lining for the China shock, but a huge and important caveat there is going to be that that silver lining is not um, shared equally across uh, areas. There's an enormous literature that, that we're contributing to, uh, you know, the, uh, in every paper you stand on the shoulders of giants, and that's certainly true here. Um, just, I won't go through all these papers in, uh, in particular, but I just want to sort of note that our this paper sort of speaks to several different literatures. One, of course, the, the employment effects of, of import competition, but also on sort of how um, shocks to firms affect sort of reorganization. So how this affects both innovation and reorganization. Um, the to degree to which we're, our estimates, our, our, um, um, our results are indicating that this is, a, is more of an offshoring shock. We also think this relates uh, quite uh, importantly to large literature zones or just the global production sharing. Um, and then, of course, there's a large literature as well, sort of the sort of ex the other benefits of the import competition shock, including lower prices, uh, welfare effects. Um, new export opportunities. We're not going to speak to these directly, but our, our work sort of does uh, indicate some, some potential positive effects of the China shock as well. Can I, can I ask a question? Um, yes, of course. Do you have any results on wages as well? So what I'm yeah. thinking of manufacturing jobs are typically uh, high wage jobs in particular for low skilled workers. And I guess it's mostly low skilled manufacturing jobs that are disappearing. So even if these low skilled workers now find uh, employment in other sectors because jobs there increase, these, these jobs may just be much less well paid. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so we're going to I'm going to show you some effects on wages as well. Um, uh, there's also important heterogeneity there in terms of location. So what we're going to what I'm going to be able to show you is that in these high human capital areas, we're actually going to see an increase in wages in manufacturing um, sectors, and no um, significant decrease in non-manufacturing. Uh, wages. So, so that we're going to say is relative. We think that's consistent with basically, um, you know, a sorting effect where sort of the, the least productive non-manufacturers decline and, and sort of the most productive hang around. But, but sort of none, none of this uh, negative effect. Conversely, in these low human capital areas, you're not going to see that sort of positive effect in wages and manufacturing, but you are going to see a really strong negative effect in non-manufacturing. Um, which is entirely consistent with, with your question, which is that, you know, we're going to see reductions in employment um, in these higher wage manufacturing uh, uh, areas, or sorry, uh, sectors. Um, and those individuals are going to get new, new employment, but at lower wages. Um, so so we'll, well, I'll get to that later. If there's any questions about that, um, at that point, we can, we can go into more detail there. 
All right, so really quickly, I just want to, you know, very simple sort of roadmap. We'll just go through the data and empirical strategy. It's relatively straightforward. And then we'll go through those sort of key three results. So the first, the, again, the, one of the main reasons that we're able to sort of make contributions in terms of this reorganization is because we're using the census microdata. Um, what we'll be using for employment and payroll, so again, we're going to have an establishment level average earnings and um, uh, employment, so that allows us to get sort of average earnings from payroll, uh, from the longitudinal business database. This provides us with um, basically a time series of all establishments in the U.S. that are non-farm. Gives us about 5 million firms per year, about 6 million um, establishments. Um, in order to identify industries um, of firms accurately, as accurately as possible, we're going to use the Fortin Klemek uh, industry concordance, which allows us to have sort of time consistent industry coding. This is one thing that's really important about this is um, because we're going to be showing evidence that establishments are actually changing what they're doing over time, they're going to be switching industries. Um, we want the best possible data on the actual establishments industry affiliation, which, which this data provides. Um, we'll also have some plant level characteristics um, from the census manufacturers. Um, we'll be at, um, measuring whether firms themselves are trading or non-trading firms using the firm trade transactions database. Uh, and then additionally, as sort of just some supportive evidence, we'll have some information about um, what the how the characteristics of the labor force within establishments is changing using the quarterly workforce indicators. This essentially is the firm side of the launch to uh, the LEHD, so mass worker firm data for the US. Our measure, I'll go really quickly through this because this is hopefully uh, relatively straightforward. Um, our measure of the trade shock, we're going to use the Asimoglu et al. measure. Uh, this is a slight deep variation of the uh, Ottergo and Hansen measure. Um, the basic import competition in commuting zone uh, C or some period tau um, is an industry level import competition shock apportioned to commuting zones based on sort of the employment share of that industry in the base period. Um, that industry level shock is just the change in imports from China to the US uh, divided by what we're going to call basically absorption. So basically the industry level um, consumption plus imports minus exports. Um, and in order to um, control for the endogeneity, so either supply side or demand side shocks in the US that we don't want to sort of have contaminate our estimates, we're going to use the same strategy as Osmoglu and Audergo and Hansen by basically looking at push factors measuring Chinese exports to a uh, third party set of countries to measure the increase in Chinese trade comes from um, increase in productivity uh, um, from China without uh, contaminating those supply and demand shocks. So relatively straightforward or uh, common literature. Okay, the one thing I want to point out here, and this actually again dovetails really nicely into the, the previous talk, uh, what we have here is just a map of the China shock. And this is something that I think you know people are relatively uh, familiar with now. And as you can see, you know, the sort of um, the industrial, the, the Rust Belt, as well as the South, was hit pretty hard by the China shock. The thing that I think is a little bit less well appreciated is that, um, again, this doesn't really take into account the relative size of these areas um, in terms of population, so their weight. And so one thing I want to note here is that 75% um, of the population in the U.S. is concentrated in only 124 of these commuting zones, um, where there are 722 in our sample. Um, and among these large commuting zones by population, um, the shock is not necessarily distributed the way that I think people might have thought. So this is just an appendix table from Audrey and Hansen, which shows that among large, um, highly populated areas, the largest shocks are actually in areas that have done relatively well following the China shock. So San Jose, Providence, Los Angeles, San Diego. Um, and if you sort of narrow the scope even more, half of the US population is actually only in 38 of these zones. So when we think about sort of splitting our sample by human capital or any other measure, it's important to think about sort of what uh, the characteristics of those areas that we're actually capturing. And this is going to be important when we start to look at sort of human capital intensity. These large cities 
which again are going to account for a huge amount of the identification, um, tend to be these high human capital areas. Okay. So the identification strategy, again, this is going to be really taken um, from the literature quite closely. Um, we're going to be estimating a long different specification where we're going to have some measure of, of uh, labor market outcomes, change labor market outcomes in some sector I um, or some time period tau. Um, and we're going to estimate, we're going to re regress that on our local level import competition shock, as well as a vector of controls. Um, in addition to the sort of standard set of controls, we're also going to include um, trends in our, uh, in our uh, dependent variable. Uh, so the, the one key point that I want to point out here for sort of the, ch the uh, change we're making specification, um, for our data, the economic sense, the uh, census microdata, the, the most accurate data is available in economic census years. So these are years that ends in twos and sevens. Um, so as a result, we're going to have a slight bear, a deviation from the traditional literature in the sense that the traditional literature goes 1990, 2000, and 2007 or, or further. We're going to be dealing with these economic census years. Um, we'll, I can show you some estimates that sort of deviate from that. Um, I can show you how that, how that matters. The other point that I want to make, which is again raised in the previous talk, is that you know there's a whole set of sort of bardic issues um, that that have been risen uh, that, are, uh, that have arisen in the literature. Um, we are not uh, accounting for all of these at this point. Um, we're still working on sort of making some of these, um, um, implementing some of the suggestions of this literature. Uh, one thing we're doing now, we've um, we've checked the robustness of our results to longer time periods, as well as we're going to include these pretrends in the left-hand side variables, um, which are actually going to be quite important, and in, in, in par partly because population changes are, are occurring and are correlated with the shock. Okay, so the first, uh, now that we sort of set the, the, the stage, I uh, want to sort of have a, just a, quickly go through sort of the total employment effects and sort of see how, how we sort of differ from the literature. Um, uh, the first point I want to make here is that we're going to be looking at sort of um, what are called DHS growth rates or Davis Hall and Shoot. This is going to allow us to sort of decompose the total manufacturing, the total employment effects and think about sort of entry and exit. So, so it's hard to sort of, you know, if you're using a lot of changes, it's hard to estimate sort of those uh, entry and exit margins. So, uh, the only real difference here is by instead of dividing by you know initial period employment, we're just dividing by the average. Okay, so these are our first set of results. Um, what we're going to find here again, consistent with the literature, we're going to find a robust negative effect in manufacturing employment. However, we're going to find a um, uh, positive and marginally significant positive effect in non-manufacturing employment. And as a result, the overall effect on employment is going to be uh, you know, in, uh, uh, not, not, in, not so different from zero. Um, so of course, this is different. And so there's several de deviations I want to sort of point out here. Again, we're not looking at employment to population ratios, which is the sort of the, the, the main outcome for auditor enhancement and some of the literature. We're looking at just employment changes. Um, we are changing the sort of time period. Um, and we're also changing the, 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 the underlying data source rather than, um, rather than sort of the, census, the decennial census and the ACS, we're using the underlying um, uh, longitudinal business database. So to, to get a little bit better sense of sort of where these differences come from, so why are we getting different results, um, we're then going to sort of try to compare this a little bit more directly to Watergorn and Hansen. Um, so the first thing I want to note is that you know, our estimates for manufacturing, non-manufacturing are, um, you know, similar, very close to log employment changes. Um, but as a result of dividing by sort of the sector specific employment, um, it's not the case that the sum of these two changes equal the sort of log change. Um, okay, so pointing that out, I want to sort of just move between Otter and Hansen and, and our estimates, just sort of, just to be very transparent about what choices we're making um, cause what results. Okay, so all the way to the left here, we have the uh, estimates of Otter and Hansen. Um, 
where um, we're re reproducing the total employment effects um, uh, using their data. That's not something they report. Um, and again, what you can sort of see is that um, our manufacturing results are similar. Non-manufacturing, we're getting different results. Uh, if you replicate that exact same strategy, but you use the longitudinal business database rather than the decennial census, um, we get very similar results. Um, if we shift over to using the Osimoglu based measure of import competition, we once again see robust changes uh, effects in manufacturing. Uh, here we find still basically a zero on uh, non-manufacturing and, and a zero on total. Uh, next one thing we want to point out is that these, these census years do matter, right? So this is one of the biggest departures um, in our paper is using different years. So here I'm showing you five-year differences, 92, 97, 97, 02, 02, 07. And when you do that, we find that this effect in non-manufacturing um, appears. Um, we can then add the next uh, five-year window, 2012, um, doesn't really affect results. Uh, and lastly, what we want to point out is that if we include pre-trends, and that all of our preferred specifications are going to include these pre-trends, which are basically a 10-year long difference um, in the outcome variable from 82 to 92, that does reduce this non-manufacturing employment positive effect. So there is evidence that areas that uh, grow faster non-manufacturing during the China shock were growing uh, previous to the shock. So that's an important thing, just sort of just a methodological uh, point we want to make. Um, okay, so again, this is our sort of effort to be the most transparent as we can about, you know, how we've made differences in uh, small assumptions and, and how those impact the results. Okay, so now that we've basically come to that, the, the base point that we, our first uh, finding we've illustrated, which is that we're, we are finding evidence of this um, reorganization or this sort of uh, transition from one sector to the other, we then want to think about more carefully about exactly how that's occurring within and across firms. So to do that, we're going to use the same davis holdemeyer shoe uh, total growth rate, but this is also going to allow us to look at particular margins of employment changes. So uh, in blue, we can see sort of job creation and job destruction of continuing establishments. Um, in the sort of green, we have entry and exit. Um, and then in red, we have switching. So this will allow us to think about how much of the job employment change comes from um, continuing establishments, how much comes from entry and exit, and how much comes from continuing establishments changing their industry affiliation. So the, this last one, switching, requires just a little bit more explanation, um, which is, what does switching mean? So switching essentially means, this is an establishment that we observe at the beginning of the period and at the end of the period. So it hasn't died. It continues to have positive employment over that period, at least at the beginning and end. But over that period, sometime in those five years, uh, the industry changes. And what I, what I mean by that is not that it changes at the six digit level. What we mean by switching here is very um, coarse switching, meaning switching from manufacturing to non-manufacturing or vice versa. So this is a switch between manufacturing and non-manufacturing plant. Um, okay, so that's, that's the basic way we're going to do this. We're going to estimate the effect of import competition on each of these six margins. Um, the one thing I want to point out here is that for all of these left-hand side variables for these six margins, we're going to divide by total sector employment. So those coefficients are going to add up to the total change in employment. Um, for manufacturing or non-manufacturing. Okay, so this is our first set of results. So just to point out here, the, this is our estimate of the total effect of non of uh, import competition on manufacturing employment. We found that to be negative three point five five eight. And across these uh, next six columns, these are the different um, margins that I was just showing before. So I want to point out basically three things that, are, that we think are important about this. Uh, first, uh, job destruction and continuing establishments is, is not a large driver of this effect. Um, exit of establishments and firm death is a relatively large driver. One thing I want to point out here, though, is that this includes both exit of establishments and firm death. 
This is predominantly driven by exit establishments at continuing firms. About more than 60% of this is from establishment and exit at continuing firms. This is not indicating or is not strong evidence of, of firm death. It's rather establishment death and continuing firms for the most part. Um, the third thing I want to point out, which I think is, is important, um, is that a huge amount of it, or an, a, I would say impressively large amount of this employment change, uh, about a third, is actually not death or contraction of continuing establishments, but rather establishments changing their industry affiliation. So this is about a third um, of the observed decline in manufacturing employment comes from continuing establishments reclassifying as non-manufacturing establishments. Um, okay, interesting, that's just some switching in as well. This, the China shock actually does cause, for reasons we're, we're less clear on, uh, non-manufacturing establishments to switch to manufacturing, but that's uh, significantly smaller than the, um, the outflow. Can I just uh, ask one, one, one sort of question here? Um, so you see that firms may actually even change uh, industry affiliation uh, to accommodate both the, 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 the loss of manufacturing jobs and gaining, say, other job service jobs. How much of an overlap is there among the people? So I, I, I suppose these are not the same people. These, these seem to be very different jobs. And maybe they have like different intensity of like skills, gender, age. So to understand the redistributive impact of that, even if total unemployment doesn't really change. Yes. So um, can I put you on for about two slides? Sure. Okay. So, um, um, okay. So that, that's, that's an incredibly important point. Um, and we, we've been spending a lot of time trying to get, because that, you're exactly right. I mean, to the extent to which you want to characterize that as, oh, we're overstating the employment losses, that would only be the case if all the workers stay there, right? But if the entire workforce turns over, we should just think about that as employment losses in manufacturing. So we'll, we'll, I'll show you some evidence that, um, yeah, let me put you on for just one second, sorry. Um, okay, so the, the first question I'm gonna, um, just to preview that answer, um, there is evidence that, that the labor force turns over more than in non-switching establishments. We don't, and it tends to be sort of switching, um, becomes more, um, uh, um, intensive in high earnings workers. So the exact extent to that, we're a little bit uh, constrained in how much we can say, but, but, I'll, but I'll speak more to that in just one second. Um, okay, so let's sp spend a little more time talking about the switching. So not only can we observe that, you know, these establishments exit manufacturing, we know their industry affiliation before and after, so we can actually look at where are they going and where are they coming from which also might give us some indication as to how much this is actually a true change. So what I'm showing you here is basically this is that same um, outflow of establishments. So these are establishments that are continuing but moving to non-manufacturing. And the first question is just where are they going? Um, and what we basically find is they're really changing to, moving to a small set of um, industries. So they only really move to, for the most part, uh, professional services and management, which you can think of broadly speaking as sort of headquarters establishments, and wholesale. Those are the only places they go. You know, I can split this out at the two-digit level throughout. Those are the only sort of places that pop. Again, the key thing I want to point out here is, yeah, these are, these are dominating where they're going, um, but this is not sort of mechanical in the sense that these are not large industries, right? The, um, uh, Headquarters and wholesale account for about 15% of total non-manufacturing employment. This accounts for about 85% all other. So if they were sort of just randomly switching to different industries, you know, um, if it was just sort of a data um, artifact, you wouldn't expect them to all be sort of going to this narrow set of establishments or industries. And second, we think this sort of makes a lot of sense to the extent to which firms take establishments that previously have some manufacturing and also some sort of higher um, uh, uh, higher skill sort of attributes within those establishments, you know, you might sort of take out some manufacturing and continue to use it as a headquarters plant or continue to use this wholesaling, you know, because you have these sort of production networks, but you're just not manufacturing goods. 
And we sort of take this as additional evidence that this might be sort of closer to an offshoring story where you offshore the, the manufacturing and you continue to do some of these matching business. Um, okay, so the second question you can ask, which is basically what's happening with these establishments. Uh, unfortunately, we don't, we can't say as much as we'd like to about this. So basically, because in the LBD, all I observe is um, total employment and, and payroll, it's hard to know from that data set uh, what's happened to actually employment composition. What we can do, however, is link this to the, um, the match work firm data set for the US, at least the firm side of it. And what we can basically look at is, okay, in those establishments that switch, or in firms that have establishments that switch, um, how does job turnover, job churn, sort of hiring and firing, how does that compare to establishments that don't switch? Right, so this, again, we're not really able to sort of look at the, the, the worker side, but we can observe how much these change, right? Again, this is not causal, but it'll just give us some sense of, is there more um, turnover of workers in switching establishments than not? And we see that. So basically we see that uh, by any of these measures, job reallocation, which is job creation plus destruction, hiring plus separations, or churn, sort of excess turnover, which is higher as minus creation, separation minus destruction, all three of these margins go up. Um, so just to give you, these are sort of hard estimates to, sort of to, to um, uh, interpret, but basically what this tells us is that for one standard deviation increase in sort of the employment share of a firm that switches, um, turnover goes up by about 15%. So, you know, what we're basically gonna say is that, you know, it's definitely the case that within these switching establishments, it's not as though all the workers are staying the same and they're just switching um, affiliations. So something real in terms of the employment composition is changing. Um, okay. Um, the next thing we can do, because we have, we have not only the industry affiliation of the establishment, but we also have a bunch of extra sort of firm characteristics we can think about how much of this employment change. Okay, so the first column here is again that total CZ level employment effect of the China shock, that negative 3.588 or 558. We can do the same kind of comp decomposition, but instead of decomposing by sort of establishment characteristics in terms of job creation, destruction, switching, entry and exit, we can ask, well, how much of this is occurring due to, uh, or how much of this is occurring within firms that are simultaneously expanding their employment in non-manufacturing, which is the first column. Um, and this is basically says that about 70% of that employment decline now, or within the community zones is coming within firms that are themselves simultaneously expanding their non-manufacturing employment. So this, this, this provides some evidence that this increase in non-manufacturing employment is not sort of coincidental. This is also happening within firms. Second column here shows that how much of this employment decline is occurring within firms that are, you know, um, continuing firms, continuing existing firms who are also stable importers. So they're importing at the beginning and end of the period. And we show basically that it's more than 100% of these job declines um, locally are due to importing firms. That actually means that non-importers are actually uh, increasing employment slightly. Um, and then lastly, we can say, okay, well, how much is also due to sort of large firms? So firms with more than a thousand workers. And again, that's, you know, the majority of this. So, so the point here, again, none of this is really causal in the sense that the effect on import competition is causal, but we're just cutting by different firm characteristics. And what this basically paints a picture of is the majority, a large majority of the employment declines in the U.S. within manufacturing are being are, are within firms that are simultaneously expanding non-manufacturing importers and are large, right? So this is again, it's not it doesn't concord with the story of um, a lot of exit of the of mom and pop small manufacturers. This is more culling of domestic manufacturing by these sort of large continuing firms. Okay, any questions? Great. Um, and so I guess I can show you here really quickly. Um, 
this is also the case. And so I basically, what I just showed you before was this first column here, which is the net employment growth. Uh, and the basic patterns hold throughout this. And again, the one thing I want to just point out really quickly here is that not only is the employment decline within these large, large importers uh, that are expanding on manufacturing, that's also where all of the switching is coming from. Right, so it's these large manufacturer, large firms that are also the ones that are repurposing their continuing establishments. Um, again, that doesn't tell us about uh, the net employment effects, but it's sort of important um, uh, data point. Okay, the last thing I want to point out um, that we have some evidence on here is basically just the heterogeneity across space. So, so far all we've really focused on is sort of what happens overall and how, how our results may differ slightly from the previous literature, how these um, changes are occurring within sort of reorganization within firms and within establishments. And the next question we want to ask is, well, to the extent to which we have this um, important dimensions of heterogeneity um, across establishments and firms, how does that overlay with sort of the geography of the US? And so we're gonna do a really simple cut here, um, which again, we should, we, we've cut in different ways in some manner and some dope, but I think this is for us the, the very salient way to do this. We're simply gonna estimate the effects of import competition across these margins, um, cutting very broadly by sort of high and low human capital areas. And we're going to define human capital again very simply. We're just going to look at sort of the concentration of college educated workers uh, before the China shock. So basically, college education share in 1990. Just to give you a really simple picture of what that looks like um, the orange areas are high human capital areas. The, the sort of yellow is going to be uh, low human capital. Again, one thing you can know, of course, is a huge swaths of sort of the uh, Northwest that also have high human capital, those um, account for a, a minuscule amount of our identification because it's very, very low population. Um, but you're going to note that basically the high human capital is going to account for uh, most large population area. So this is another po important point to make here. We're going to split by the median, so the median across commuting zones. Um, as a result, though, these high human capital areas contain a lot of the population. So about 80% of the population is in these high human capital areas. Um, so that's just an important thing to keep in mind as we, as we sort of review the results. Okay. So the first thing I want to do here is because we're just going to split um, our effects in total manufacturing, non-manufacturing, and total employment by high versus low human capital. Um, now here, what I'm showing you um, is these effects are additive, so the, the, the non-manufacturing manufacturing effects are going to add up to the total. And there's not a huge difference here, um, but the main things you want to point out here is there's a, a, rel a smaller effect in total in manufacturing employment, these high human capital areas, as we sort of mentioned, uh, foregrounded earlier. And we don't see any real evidence of an offsetting positive effect in non-manufacturing in these low human capital areas. As a result, neither of these are significant, but we're seeing a, you know, if you focus only on the point estimates, a positive effect on employment and high human capital and a negative effect on money. Switching our estimate uh, to earnings, which I, I foregrounded before, um, here, as I mentioned before, we do now find a positive effect in, in earnings in these high human capital areas in manufacturing. Again, we think this is consistent with basically uh, survival of higher productivity manufacturing establishments. Um, and we don't really see any offsetting negative effects in non-manufacturing. So even though there is some reallocation from manufacturing to non-manufacturing, we're not seeing sort of a, a depression of wages. The story is really different if you look at non-manufacturing. We're not seeing any real evidence of positive employment effects, in, or, uh, sorry, earnings effects in low human capital areas. But we are seeing very strong negative effects in earnings in low human capital areas. So this is consistent with a larger negative effect on, on employment and manufacturing and that excess um, labor being allocated to sort of lower wage uh, non-manufacturing activities. And, and so we can also do something where we can sort of decompose, that we can once again use our decomposition to decompose those employment effects. And now here I've changed the estimates slightly. So these are now, these are no longer sort of the share of total employment. These are just looking at sort of the, basically log change in manufacturing employment, essentially. Um, 
the reason I want to do this is sort of highlight a key point here. So in column A, we simply have the, the net effect on employment growth. Now, remember that the effect um, overall, non-interacted, was that 3.558 negative and significant. Um, you know, the point estimates are not super different, but we have much more precision as low human capital areas. Okay, so that doesn't, doesn't show you too much. But when you dig into the actual, when you decompose that into sort of the switching margin versus the all else margin, there's a pretty striking sort of difference here, right? So in column two, we have what's called net switching. So this is switching in minus switching out. So that's sort of the net of employment change that's due to this reclassification of, of establishments. And what you can see here is that basically the, the vast majority of that switching um, is occurring in these high human capital areas. Right, so not only is, is switching within large firms, um, within importers, and within um, firm expanding on manufacturing, it's also highly concentrated in these high human capital areas. Um, and again, this makes some sense if we think about where that switching was, what industries that switching was occurring in, right? So again, a, a huge part of that switching was in headquarters, Right. So if you have a, a manufacturing establishment, say in Boston or outside of Boston, the high human capital area, um, you're more likely to, if you want to shut down that manufacturing, uh, our thinking is you're more likely to turn that into a headquarters or, you know, um, management establishment and not close it. Conversely, if you have a, um, a manufacturing establishment in a much lower human capital area, you're more likely just to close it and not switch it, re re um, repurpose it for um, just two minutes, sorry, two yeah. minutes. Okay, great, thank you. Um, okay, so and then once you take that into account, if we can call them three years, but just conventional employment changes, right? So basically, we'll take estimates of column one, we'll subtract out the switching. That's a strong assumption. We're just saying, you know, uh, that's all just reclassification. And what you can see then is that the effect in these low-income capital areas is much um, different or stronger. In the one minute here, very quickly, I just want to point out one important caveat which is that, again, we're using firm data, which measures jobs, not bodies, right? So every job that appears in the data is the location of the job and the number of jobs. So if someone has two jobs, you'll count twice. Um, and if you work somewhere where you, not where you live, I'm counting where you work. That appears to be an important distinction. So Laos is uh, an, uh, a um, household survey data set used to construct unemployment statistics. So that's that's um, worker location. LBD is, um, is job location, right? So I won't go through all this uh, for, um, for time, but the key point I wanna make here is the negative effects look stronger in the Laos. They look stronger when you use household data. So this is another reason why our estimates might differ from Audrey and Hansen and how the literature uses these household data sets. Second, that difference is much stronger in high human capital areas. So there's, there's differences. So the extent to which you wanna sort of compare um, geography, um, understanding the differences in the data sets is important. Okay, I'll, I'll sort of just take a second to summarize. So the key uh, takeaways um, are sort of threefold. One, um, we're finding that there's not, there are, you know, consistent with the literature, large non-manufacturing job losses. However, those are somewhat offset by increases in certain sector employment that is mirrored by our sort of firm level analysis, which shows that reorganization within firms, which seems to look like supporting offshore and related activities, um, is also um, reshaping employment towards these non-manufacturing service occupations and industries. The caveat there though, is that this is predominantly happening in high human capital areas. So, you know, the, the, these high human capital areas are seeing this large offsetting effect and sort of, which is mitigating these negative employment and wage effects. Whereas in these low human capital areas, um, there appears to be near, not nearly as much of this offsetting um, reorganization. Um, okay, I, I'll stop there. Thanks very much, that's good.